Would you look with me, first of all, in that very familiar text of Matthew chapter 28, yet one that is gloriously important for us in Matthew 28 and verse 16. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then to Matthew chapter 22, if you would look with me at verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard this, that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may his word be preached for you. Please be seated. <clears throat> if you'll keep your uh, Bibles open to those two texts, and I want to be referring to a number of other texts this morning as we're coming to the Lord's Supper. Uh, we try to do this on either the first or the second Sunday of January, uh, Lord's Day morning. Is, uh, it's a wonderful way to gather around the table. If you'll notice in the text, uh, if you'll notice the text that gives us the institution, it's repeatedly said as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup. The Bible doesn't tell us how often, but it does tell us to bring focus to it. And that's the, that's the tradition, the biblical tradition we bring to it. And that is communion seasons where we have 10 to 12 times a year of Sunday morning and Sunday night in which the entire week is focused on coming to the Lord's table. And so it is for this week uh, as we come to the Lord's table this morning. But uh, I was trying to think through how to come to this, and I wanted to do it this way because of the anticipation of our ministry theme in this coming year of Project Andrew, Bring Them to Him. And here's the way I, I'd like for you to think through this with me. I'm going to go kind of at 30,000 feet here. Uh, if, if you will, with me. But in the, earth, the first church planted after the ascension of Jesus is clearly, uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament, is clearly the church at Jerusalem. And it becomes a pattern church for us, uh, not because of its numerical size, but because of the dynamics and the commitments and what was accomplished in that church. And uh, in, that, uh, in that church, we, are, we, we see two things readily. And that is God's church is fed by the two gifts he has given from heaven to us, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, God's Word and God's Spirit. And then God has given us a means whereby that Word and that Spirit bring us to Christ, mature us in Christ, and grow us in Christ. And that um, Word and that Spirit is delivered in a number of ways that God has designed, but I like the way that it's put together in Acts chapter 2. Just stop and think. The church at Jerusalem was birthed in a prayer meeting, Acts chapter 1, 120. It, I'm sorry, it was conceived in a prayer meeting, Acts chapter 1. 120 were in the prayer in the upper room. Then it was birthed in preaching of the Word in Acts chapter 2. So they came together to pray in Acts 1. Then they went out preaching in Acts 2, and God brought in 3,000. That's probably just counting the men. And then the Lord, it says, the Lord added to their number every day. So we tend to think of that in sweep of 3,000, say, well, isn't that wonderful? What really ought to, I think, perhaps also grab our attention is every day God's Word and God's Spirit through God's church were bringing people to Christ daily. Now, how are these people being discipled? 
because that was their mission, to go and make disciples. And he said, you can't do it unless I'm with you, and I'll be with you by my Spirit. So you wait for my Spirit, and then with power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. And so as the Spirit of God empowered them, and the Word of God was given to them, how did they mature God's people by, his, by the Spirit and the Word? Well, it says in Acts 2.42, that they were continually, that intentionally, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Those four things, think of them this way with me. The ministry of the Word proclaimed, preaching and teaching, the apostles' teaching. Secondly, the ministry of the Word shared, fellowship. Not, not like the world that sows seeds of discord, but sowing seeds of accord, speaking the truth in love to one another that you've heard, now sharing. Then comes the preaching, and then comes not only the Word proclaimed and the Word shared, but today the Word displayed. Now, stop and think, why would I say that? When the Apostle Paul speaks of preaching the Word and he puts it into a, uh, a bumper sticker, as close to a bumper sticker as he can, what does he say? I determined to know nothing among you but what? Christ and Him what? Crucified. In other words, are there monumental moments in the incarnate life of Christ? Yeah. How about the virgin conception and birth? Yeah, uh, how about the cross? Yes, how about the resurrection, the empty tomb? Yes, how about the ascension? And yes, how about the second coming? But what's interesting to me is when those key moments in the life and ministry of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, are highlighted, they're all crucial. But the one that becomes the focal point is the cross. Now, without the virgin birth, there couldn't have been an atoning death. We had to have God having come in the flesh. And if there hadn't been a resurrection to affirm the triumph of the atoning death, then it would, that would, we would just consider this uh, some misguided person that made claims that died. No, the resurrection is crucial. The ascension is crucial. The second coming, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The inc all of those are crucial. But it's the cross that Paul says that we focus upon. Why? Because it's there that the love of God that we just sung about meets the holiness of God so that sinners can be saved by the grace of God. And God is just. Remember the Bible says all that the Bible says that the wrath of God is displayed and revealed against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness. And one of the things that I'll be reminded of as I sit with you at the table today is the wrath of God against all of my sins has been displayed at the cross where Jesus bore it for us. And so we now have this glorious message that the holiness of God has met the love of God to save sinners by the grace of God, to the glory of God, through the Son of God, in this atoning death that He died on the cross. There's the focal point. Well, interestingly, what is the theology of baptism? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What is the theology? That we've got two sacraments that Jesus has left us, baptism and the Lord's Supper. What is the theology of the Lord's Supper? Body and blood. Praise God, the manger. Praise God, the empty tomb. Praise God, the crown. Praise God, the second coming. But all my hope and plea was the shedding of the blood of Jesus for me. And that's where he brings us to a fixed point. So whether it's the preaching of the word, Christ and him crucified, whether it's the fellowship where we encourage one another as those forgiven with truth and love, or the word, the word shared, 
or whether it is the word displayed in the sacraments, we are brought back to that fixed point of who Christ is and what he has done. It had to be Jesus on that cross. Nobody else could atone. But he had to give an atonement because the blood of bulls and goats can't save us. They're only telling us you need a substitute and that the wages of sin is death. And then here we are now with that glorious last part, which uh, John just reminded us of, and that is our need of prayers. They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching, the word proclaimed, the fellowship, the word shared. They gave themselves to the breaking of the bread. That doesn't mean hospitality meals. That definite article is taking us to the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread. And then it is they were gloriously devoting themselves to the prayers, personal prayers, family prayers, worship prayers, petition prayers, praise prayers, intercessory prayers, supplication prayers, all kinds of praying were God's people doing. And that's how he displays the church. That's how he, did, he profiles this church for us. But he brings us, but what does, and one of the things that we do is practice the Lord's Supper often with focus. Don't just tack it on to the end of a service and don't ignore it, only doing it maybe once a year, but bringing it often, yet bringing it with focus. Now, when you do that and when you bring that to bear, what are you saying? Well, you're saying a number of things. What the Lord said, what has God designed this supper to do for us? Let me suggest three things for you. Number one, he has designed it. Well, let me put it this way. It's your renewal. It's revival time. The Lord's Supper is revival time. It is a means that God has designed and appointed to revive our souls with three things. Uh, uh, let me give you these three things. Number one, it gives you a time for repentance. See, when we talk about the body and blood of Jesus, how are we saved? Are we saved by what we do or by what he did? Uh, this is good. Come on now. Daniel, I need some help. Uh, we, we're, we're saved how? By his work. Do you believe in salvation by work? Sure, just not mine. The work of Jesus. The work that Jesus did for me on the cross and the work that Jesus is doing in me from heaven through the Spirit and his word. And I praise God for that. And my hope and plea is only in the body and blood. Well, if that's true, if I am saved by what he did, then that gives me the freedom to be able to examine what I'm doing and what is sin can be what? Confessed and repented of. Repentance. The Lord's Supper gives us an opportunity to remove those things in our life that are breaking our intimacy. Now, Jesus loves you. You don't have to be perfect for Jesus to keep loving you. No, you are perfected in Christ. But our sins can break fellowship with the Lord. And so this gives us a time to clear accounts for us. Now, you don't have to wait till the Lord's Supper to repent. It's just a stark call from the Lord. I want to remind you, you're saved at the cross, not by what you did. Therefore, you're now free to be honest with what we did right, what we did wrong, what we did right, praise God from whom all blessings flow, what we did wrong, Lord, I confess and I repent. Secondly, the second blessing of renewal is not only repentance as we, as the table says, examine ourselves, but we also examine our relationships in the body of Christ, reconciliation. You must discern the body and blood of the Lord, the text says. And that's why the table calls us to right relationships in the Lord of forgiveness. There's something the world cannot do. The world cannot forgive. But we can readily do so. We can readily do so when someone repents, and we've already done so in our heart, even as the Lord has forgiven us. Thirdly, the third thing is, is and this is kind of one that I like to put this way to keep my R's going, if you don't mind, repentance and uh, reconciliation. And number three is recalibration. This gets me back to the fixed point. You know, as Christians, isn't it, particularly those of you who are serious in your walk with the Lord, it is so easy to get discouraged, isn't it? Because we are not where we want to be. But the Bible is telling you, no, I want to remind you, you're where God has you in the blood and righteousness of Jesus. Now you're free to say, Lord, I'm not where I want to be, but I praise God I'm not where I was. 
saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. So we can recalibrate and get our confidence and our assurance back where it belongs, not on how we're doing, but what he did for us. To get our confidence and our assurance back where it belongs on Christ and our purchase of our salvation at the cross where he ransomed us. So we can recalibrate, and that maybe could say get back to the basics. And that's why I'm glad we're doing this at the first of the year, and that's why I'm glad we're doing this as we walk into this coming year. Folks, the winds of, the, the winds of war, culture wars, spiritual wars, all kind of wars are all around us. There's no doubt about that. The winds of war are all around. They're swirling. What do you do in moments like this? Our tendency is to think, well, as a Christian or as a church, we've got to come up with some ingenious program. Or we've got to have some kind of a quasi-messiah. It's a personality. It's a program. It's our ingenuity. It's our sophistication. I'm going to suggest to you, no, it's our recalibration. Back to the basics. Back to the basics. That's what I'm going to suggest to you. And I think the Lord's Supper is a wonderful time for us to do that. What are the basics for me as a Christian? What are the basics for us as a church? What does it mean to get back to the basics, to be recalibrated in terms of what the Lord is doing in our life? Well, it's very clear to me that when Jesus was resurrected, he called called the first general assembly of the church. The first general assembly of the church was not in Acts chapter 15. It was in Matthew chapter 28. Church wasn't very big. He had 11. And he called them together. And he said to them prior to his ascension, all authority. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Those whom they, he had discipled, when they saw him, the product of his discipleship was seen. What did they do? They worshiped him. Even with their doubts, they worshiped him. And then what does he say? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and what? Make disciples. There's your command. This is what you do, church. Our job is not to reclaim the culture of the 1950s and the 1960s. Our job is not to transform the culture. Our job is not cultural reclamation or transformation. If it becomes that, we'll either get culturally isolated or culturally accommodated. Our job is center transformation. The product is cultural transformation. That's the blessed consequence. That's our job. Jesus said this, until the end of the age, I'll be with you to do what? Make disciples. That's your mission. That's what I've called you to do. Make disciples. And I want my church, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Why? So that you can be on mission. Make disciples. And that's our business. That's what we're here. God's got a job for the government. He'll hold them accountable. God's got a job for your family. God's got a job for family, the institution of creation. God's got a job for government, the institution of the fall, to retard sin and restrain sin. God's got a job for his church in light of redemption. And that is to make disciples until the day of the consummation. And we are called to do that. That is what we are called to do is to be on that mission of the Great Commission. And what is our message? Our message is the gospel of Christ wrapped in the whole counsel of God. We preach and teach. That's why I have been committed my entire life, moving now into the 50th year or toward the 50th year. My entire life has been toward expository preaching because I believe the job is to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. Yeah, pastor teachers are called to equip the saints through the ministry of the word. And what is that? Expository preaching. So thank God for every 30 plus congregational communities that have Bible teaching in them, small groups that have Bible teaching in them, as this cascade of discipleship starts at a pulpit, moves to the lectern, goes to the small group, and then comes into your own personal and family life. The word and the spirit at work in your life. With what? 
the gospel contoured, the gospel centered, the gospel circumference, whole counsel of God. It takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And so we are going to be committed to that message on mission and on message, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And I'll be with you even to the end of the age. That's why Paul said to the church at Ephesus when he left them after three years, I'm innocent of your blood. Why? Because I taught you the whole counsel of God. Or as Philippians says, holding forth the word of life. That's what God's called us to do. On mission, make disciples. On message, a gospel-wrapped declaration of God's whole counsel, his word. All 66 books are inspired and profitable for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be discipled, adequate, and equipped for every good work. Thirdly, we need to be in ministry. There are four basic ministries for your personal life, your family life, and for this church, and they're right there in the Great Commission. What's the first mission we've got? Evangel. What's the first ministry we've got? It's the ministry of outreach to the world. It's called evangelism. See what it says? Go. It really should be translated, as you are going, make disciples. Now listen to me carefully. Please listen to this. Without any, I'm not going to take time to talk about causes and effects. The day of the receptor church that grows by opening the doors is gone. There are no cultural pressures to go to church. Now we have to make up our mind. Are you going to bring people through the doors for entertainment? Are we going to bring people through the doors for a promise of success in life? Are we going to bring people through the doors to hear Jesus say, I will save you from your sins? They're not going to knock down the door. When we scatter, we've got to go to them. We're no longer, once you're saved, you're no longer a mission field. You're now a missionary. And that's what God's called us to do, to go, to seek, and to save the lost. Secondly, what do you do with them after you do the ministry of evangelism? It's the ministry of enfolding into the body of Christ. I love, what, I love what Paul says about the church. He calls it the fellowship. I know all of you have watched Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the ring. Well, praise the Lord, interesting movie. We're the fellowship of Christ. That's what we are. We're not the only fellowship of Christ, but we belong to the fellowship of Christ. That's what we are. So when people come to Christ, they are enfolded, baptized, and in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and the believer and the households were enfolded into the body of Christ. Then what do we do? Let's start equipping, teaching them to observe all. You see those participles there? Going, baptizing. Number three, teaching. Now we start equipping them with the Word of God. That's that small group discipleship. That's that life-on-life stuff that we do. It's initiated from a pulpit, but it's carried into boots on the ground. Then what do we do? Well, then what we do is success is exalted. Here's the way I put it. There's one sanctified sport, and that's baseball. No other discussion. That's it. So I'm going to use that illustration. To be on mission, on message, we've got to do the ministry, and the ministry scores. When you get to first base, that's evangelism. You get to second base, that's enfolding. You get to third base, that's equipping. And you know the job's being done when those who fell short of the glory of God now has had their greatest delight to give glory to God, and they worshiped Him. Now you see it, they worshiped Him. And that's what God has called us to do, on mission, on message, in ministry. I made just one last comment, and the culture of the church is the great commandment. The great commandment where you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love those made in the image of the Lord as yourself. 
Just as you've known the love of God in your life, you want that love to be in their life who are made in the image of God. Well, pastor, what if they're Democrats or Republicans? What if they're old or young? What if their skin color is different? They're made in the image of God and headed to hell. Love them with the gospel because you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. In this polarized, fractious, divisive, angry society, we've got to put something different in front of them. And it comes not through therapy. It comes through doxology. Love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And then those who are made in his image as ourselves. I think there will be three marks. Courage. Perfect love. Is there anything greater love than the love of God? Perfect love cast out all fear. We'll be courageous no matter what the winds are swirling around us. Secondly, we'll not only be courageous, but by God's grace, we can be compassionate. Not angry. Anger at sin, praise the Lord. But going after sinners with compassion. The drunk, here's my home. The sexually immoral, let's sit down and talk. Those who would bring the deconstruction of an entire civilization, come. I want to reason with you. Always being ready to give an account of the hope that's within us. How? With gentleness, clarity, courage, compassion. And that means civility. Say what we mean, mean what we say. And never mean when we say it. That's what God has called us to be and to do. And that culture in the embassy of the kingdom of God, his church, is at least a door opener to share the words of the gospel to others. Recalibrate a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission on mission, on message, and ministries. Ministries of evangelism to the world, ministry of enfolding to one another, the ministry of equipping, and then the ministry of evangelism. I mean, the ministry of exaltation and giving worship and praise to God. Out of our love to the Lord and loving those made in His image, courage, compassion, and civility. I think that's the recalibration. And it doesn't start with a program. It starts with our hearts. And God's designed this table to speak to our hearts. Maybe I'll illustrate it this way. If you were the coach of the most elite basketball program in your day and time, and you had your new team there for the new season, what would you do? Well, I can tell you what John Wooden would do. And it's documented. The first week of practice, the first day of practice, the first words out of his mouth was teach them how to put their socks on and how to lace up their shoes. He didn't go into drop steps. He didn't go into fakes. He didn't go in, in none of that. Here's how you put your socks on. Here's how you lace up your shoes. Here's how you walk on the court properly ready to play. And then he went to dribbling. Here's how you fingertip dribble. Here's how you, and then he went to passing. Get the picture? He works on the basics. The most elite team and successful in his era. Or if you're old enough as me, you can remember the, I think, unmatched dynasty of the Green Bay Packers under Vince Lombardi. And the way did he start practice off? Gentlemen, this is a football. You see, he knew they didn't get beat because of a lack of sophistication. You got to know how to block, tackle, pass, run. That's what you got to do. Ted Williams used to write about how he loved to get to spring training because of all of the hundreds of swings he could take in the batting practice, the greatest hitter that's ever lived. 
Or if you're going to go to war, what do you do? You take your soldiers and you put them in a boot camp and under adversity, you teach them basic training. How do you do the basics under adversity? How do you do them right? Or if you're arguably the greatest golfer that's ever lived, Jack Nicklaus, certainly a debate there, but every day, every season, you start by going to your coach. You're the greatest golfer living, and you go to your coach and say, Mr. Grout, would you teach me how to play golf? Teach me the grip. Get to the basics. Whether it's heroes in war, athletes, the field of adversity, those who are the most effective are those who do the basics right. I believe one of the great basics in the Christian life as we seek to make disciples and love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind is personal evangelism. Every generation, every person's got to hear. You can't be saved without believing. You can't believe without hearing. You must hear. And one of my great heroes that I want to walk you through for the next three Sundays is Andrew. We're going to call it Project Andrew. So if you want to read ahead, it's John 1, John 6, and John 12. But we're going to take a look at what Andrew did as he would bring people to Jesus. He would bring people that would lead 3,000 to Jesus. He would bring people that could be used of Jesus to feed 5,000. He would bring people to Jesus that Jesus' eyes would light up and say, now my time has come. Project Andrew, can we be an Andrew? Folks, listen, I love our legacy of world missions. Utterly committed to it. As, as, uh, as I, this, this enormous, sacrificial, faithful, generous um, giving that you did at the end of the year that Bruce just talked about, I praise God for that. That's just amazing. In fact, I can't wait till they get to a couple of weeks and they can tell you the 11 nations that we now get to plant a church because of that, that we had on, on hold, and now we're able to plant those churches in 11 nations. And every one of you there called a cross-cultural missionary, we're going to get you there by God's grace. But every one of us are missionaries right here. Every one of us can bring them to him by bringing him to them. Let's pray about that. And that same generous sacrificial spirit that was manifested in your stewardship might be manifested in our evangelism. Let's pray about it. Even as you thank God for your salvation at the table. Pray about God this year. Help me bring them to him who was sent for me. May I bring them to him who was sent for them. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together in your word. Thank you, Jesus, for the way that you work in and through our lives in glorious and wonderful ways. May I just ask you, Jesus, would you please speak to the hearts of your people as they come to the table. Prepare our hearts now as we come to him who is worthy, as we come to him who shed his blood by, because he gave his life in our place that we could have eternal life. Would you fill us with such a love of Jesus that we have a love for Jesus that we want out of love to bring Jesus to them that we might bring them to him? Even as we focus in these moments in personal repentance, reconciliation, and recalibration, turn our hearts to those who need him. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.